So thanks for including me and the cut flower industry. It's always fun to go out and see all these pretty flowers. And Melanie finds a lot of the diseases too. So it's not just me who is out there investigating. Let's see, somehow this presentation is not moving. There we go. So first thing we found last year was in one of Melanie's trials. It was a virus on Freesia called Freesia sneak virus. This virus has two hosts, Freesia and Lacanalia. Melanie's incidence was only the third report for the country. And so we had to involve the Utah Department of Ag. And they were debating for a while if they thought it was of importance or not. But then they decided since it was free shop was not a big crop grown in Utah, it wasn't that much of a problem. So the symptoms that you see on freesia leaves. It can look a little bit like insect feeding. You see these chlorotic and necrotic lesions, those brown purplish lesions. It could also be mistaken for a fungal infection. So we did some testing and we identified the freesia sneak virus. And it was only a few of the bulbs that were actually infected and it probably came with the planting stock that, that Melanie bought. It's spread by a soil-borne fungus. Unless you bring it in on infected bulbs, the fungus is Alpidium brassica. It infects the roots and in the process, it transmits that virus. We looked at the roots and we could not find the Alpidium. That's why we think it, it came in on those infected bulbs. There's no mechanical transmission. So if you cut the flowers and you go from one plant to the next, you will not be able to transmit Freesia sneak virus. And the management is very simple. You'll just have to take out those infected bulbs and destroy them. There's no other way to manage that virus. Prithium root rot is a recurring incidence it's the same pathogen that also causes damping off. So if you have seedling trays and you had some plants that may have died of damping off in those trays, but you had other plants that still looked healthy, you planted them in your field and they then develop prithium infections. It could still be from a latent infection that they had obtained as seedlings in those seedling trays. Prithium root rot, affects cut flowers, vegetables, and hemp, and it can just stay in the soil. If it had a suitable host in the previous year and you plant a susceptible host the next year in that same location, the Pythium could infect and rot those roots from those plants as well. The symptoms you initially see are the plants starting to wilt. And if you pull them up, the roots are discolored. The cortex, which is the Outer part of the root, you can just pull off. It easily comes on off, and then you only see that inner core of the root that is left. And sometimes it can also rot the lower part of the stem. So here you can see a picture that where that arrow points. So this is just the inner core of the root that's left. The outer part, that cortex that you can still see up here is gone. And that's a good indication of Pythium root rot. The management for Pythium is you do not want to overwater. Pythium has spores that have hair-like appendages, so it can move in a film of water. So if you have a lot of standing water, it makes it easy for the spores to move from root to root. If you can put in drip irrigation, that can minimize the disease incidence because you won't have standing water. Disinfect your tools that come in contact with the soil. So if you have shovels, trowels, um, even tractor tires or boots, make sure that you wash off all the dirt before you move to another part of your field. And also buy healthy transplants. If a transplants look already yellow, 
They may just need some nitrogen, but there could also be a problem with the roots. They could have a root rot caused by Pythium or some of the other fungal pathogens. So I would probably skip those. Powdery mildew we see very frequently in, in Utah. It's an obligate parasite. So it needs living plant tissue to survive. If the leaves die, if the plant dies, and the powdery mildew has not prepared for overwintering or just surviving adverse conditions, it will die as well. A lot of the plants do get powdery mildew. There's a few like conifers or ginkgos or cactus that are not infected with at least one species of powdery mildew. And some powdery mildews infect many different plants and others are very host specific. It does not need free water on the leaves to infect. Actually, rain can be detrimental. So if you have a very rainy summer, you will see very little powdery mildew. All it needs is in the morning, two, three hours of high humidity on the, between the leaves so the spores can germinate, colonize the leaf. And after that, it can be bone dry and powdery mildew will be happy. It's spread by spores that are called conidia. They can be carried by the wind for miles. Infected plants that contact non-infected plants, those spores are very loose on the surface of the leaf. So any wind movement that brushes leaves against each other, the spores will fall off and can then colonize those new leaves. And then dispersal by humans. If you brush by those plants that have powdery mildew, you get the spores on your pants. And then if you brush by healthy plants, you deposit the spores. In the winter time, powdery mildew is usually produce overwintering fruiting bodies that have spores inside that will stay there until conditions improve. They can survive on dead plant material. So if the leaves fall off that had powdery mildew in the summer, these overwintering fruiting structures can be on those leaves. In some cases, it can also, the mycelium can survive in the crack of bark or in buds. And if you have a very mild winter, if let's say you're in Southern Utah and it doesn't freeze and the green plant tissue stays alive, it can survive on that green plant tissue. So here's just a general life cycle of powdery mildew. So in the spring, you have those fruiting structures that release the spores. The spores will find a host, leave, they colonize. Then it takes about seven to 10 days before you see the first white colonies after the infection to develop on a leaf. On these white colonies, conidia are produced. They're often produced in chains. They easily fall off if there's a light breeze. And then these spores find another new leaf they can colonize. And this cycle will repeat itself all summer long every seven to 10 days. So if you want to treat with fungicides, you have to apply those fungicides in the same seven to 10 day interval to keep up with the spore production. Now, once conditions get bad, it gets cold or the plant seems to deteriorate and die, the powdery mildew will switch from producing those conidia to producing survival fruiting structures. They then overwinter on the plant debris until conditions improve and then the cycle starts again. So on cut flowers, we have found so far one powdery mildew called Golovinomyces ambrosia, on dahlias, zinnias, and celosia. Podosphera panosa goes to roses. It also goes to peaches. And you see white patches where the entire leaf is covered in a white powder. So if you look on those leaves, it looks like you took a bag of flour and you sprinkled it on those leaves. Environmental conditions, it likes it dry and warm. High humidity for a few hours are needed for infection. And it often occurs later in the season. We don't often see it very early in the year. Management fungicide applications, including sulfur or green, work very well. You need to start, as I mentioned, as soon as you see the first spots that are developing. 
A reminder, do not apply sulfur above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you will fry your plants. So either apply the sulfur very early in the morning, so there's two or three hours before you hit 90 degrees, or late in the evening after it cooled down below 90 degrees. Also, you want to check the sulfur and every other fungicide that's registered for ornamentals on a couple of flowers or plants first to determine that there's no phytotoxicity. Some plants are very sensitive to sulfur or other fungicides and you could get burned leaves or damage to your flowers. Now, Southern Blight was a kind of an unusual fungus for Utah. We found it last year in Iris. A sample was sent to the diagnostic lab. I'm including it here because it can also go to tulips, dahlias, daffodils, as well as some vegetables. So southern blights caused by Sterosium rolfsii. It's a soil-borne pathogen. It can be brought in on, on tubers or bulbs. And the first thing you see at the base of leaves are brown spots. They are, it's a very fast growing mycelium. So if you see a brown spot, you might not see any mycelium. And then you look a couple of days later and it's all across the back. For me, it produces sclerotia. Sclerotia are hard balls of mycelium. They're survival fruiting structures of a fungus that's usually soil borne. They look a little bit like mustard seed for southern blight. And these can survive for several years in the soil, just hanging around waiting for a suitable host to come. This fungus likes it warm and it likes it moist. So this last two years, we had very high temperatures in the summertime and we had quite a bit of rain, which is ideal for this pathogen. It's very common in the southeastern United States where you have a lot of rain and high humidity all summer long. So here are some pictures. So this is the mycelium. You see that develops on these brown spots on the leaves. And you can almost watch it grow. It, it grows that fast. Here are some of those necrotic spots before the mycelium gets developed. And these are the sclerotia. They're very easy to see. You don't need a hand lens or anything. They're about the size of uh, mustard seed as well. Management for southern blight, destroy infected plants and tubers, monitor new planting material, and remove about three inches of the soil around an infected plant. So if you detect that plant very early, it's enough to remove the three inches because it will not have grown any further into the soil at that time. There are no fungicides that are effective for Southern Plight. And I still think it's going to be an oddball in Utah. We might occasionally see an infection here or there, and it will usually be brought in on infected plant material. Now, Dahlia mosaic virus is still around, and it's probably going to stay around for quite a while longer. There are three strains. There's the D10, which is most common in the US as well as in Utah. This is a virus that's actually incorporated into the plant genome. And it's there's a debate. Some people claim it does not cause symptoms. We actually do see symptoms on some of those plants. The Portland strain is the least common. And then there's the Holland strain. They can occur either individually in a plant, or you can get any combination of them, including all three. It's transmitted by aphids as well as it, the D10 can be on seed, and all three of them can be in tubers. The symptoms you see on the leaves are chlorosis. They're usually caused by the Holland strain, mostly that we see it. You get some deformation of leaves. You can get reduced flower production, color breaking on the flowers, and stunted plants. So here are some pictures. 
You can also see a mosaic pattern. Here's some dark green and light green spots on those leaves. Another leaf here where you see this dark green, light green pattern. Sometimes this pattern can be hard to see. It might depend on how you have the light going onto those leaves. And here on this flower, you can see the color breaking on the outer edge here of that flower, where it's kind of very pale red to pink. It's very difficult to manage Dahlia mosaic virus, just like any other virus infected plant, destroy infected plants and tubers. If you can get it, use certified disease-free seed or tubers. I know they're very hard to come by. Do not over fertilize. In our 2022 fertilizer trial, plants that had excessive amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium showed more severe symptoms than plants that had the recommended amount of fertilizer. Tobacco streak virus is another virus we frequently see in dahlias. It has over 200 hosts, including vegetables, field crops, and ornamentals. The only other crop I've seen it was actually summer squash. And that was only one incidence in one year, but it's quite widespread in dahlias. It's indirectly transmitted by thrips through pollen. So it's, the thought is that the thrips feed on the leaves, pollen falls onto those wounds that are created by the thrips, and then the virus can enter the, the leaves and infect the plant. It can be seed borne and seed transmitted in some species, and in dahlias, we find it in the tubers. We also have seen one plant that was a calendula that had it on, in one year, but it was only one of the plants. Here are some symptoms of tobacco streak virus. You get these yellow streaks usually right along the veins. That's very characteristic of this virus. And sometimes you can get them in a combination with other viruses that then obscure the symptoms a little bit. And testing helps identify how many viruses are actually in those dahlias. To manage tobacco streak virus, Again, destroy infected plants and tubers, insect control if you can uh, manage thrips, if you have a lot of them with insecticides that might be beneficial, not only for management of tobacco streak virus, but thrips can also transmit tomato spotted wilt virus and in patients necrotic spot virus that can also infect a lot of cut flowers, including dahlias and zinnias. And here I have one picture of a mixed infection of tobacco streak with tomato spotted wilt virus. So you see the, the st yellow streaks along the veins. But if you look very closely and it's not that easy to see down here, you can see some ring spots that are caused by tomato spotted wilt virus. Now move on to phytoplasma. So phytoplasma are bacteria that don't have a cell wall. So you can't culture them. They can't live outside either the insect that transmits them or outside the plant. Mostly leafhoppers transmit them. The beet leafhopper or the aster leafhopper would be the ones in Utah that most likely spread it in cut flowers. There are several phytoplasma species that can infect ornamentals. And sometimes the symptoms can be mistaken for herbicide damage. So if you look here, this is a, a cosmos plant where you have, instead of a flower developing, you get these additional leaf type structures that come out. And then if we test them, they come back as infected with a phytoplasma. So this is called phyllody. Parts of the, or the entire flower is replaced with leaves. And the symptoms look very similar on a lot of Asteraceae. You can also find it on Veronica plants. So here you have a healthy Veronica plant. And then this one here 
It's infected with a phytoplasma. Area up here stays green. It's a little bit flattened and deformed. To manage phytoplasmas, monitor for leaf hoppers with sticky cards. You can easily see them with a hand lens on those sticky cards, and then you know that they are present. Remove symptomatic plants because the leaf hoppers can acquire the phytoplasma from infected plants. And just like with viruses, once a plant is infected, there's no cure for it. So you might as well remove it. Now, here's a fun new disease that showed up that's leafy gall. The causal agent is Rhodococcus faciens. It's a soil borne pathogen. It can also grow on the surface of plant material. It enters the plant tissue usually through wounds or natural openings like lenticels or stomates. The bacteria manipulate the hormone levels in the plant. And there's over 80 known hosts, including dahlias, delphinium, sunflower, and many other ornamentals. The symptoms you see are fasciation. So the stems are flattened and they look ribbon-like. You can also get shoot proliferation. You get numerous shoots emerging from one area. They're very dense. There's one shoot right next to the other. And you can get stunted plants or reduced root growth. These symptoms can also be caused by other organisms as well as herbicides. So area feared mites can cause these symptoms in some plants. Phytoplasmas can cause these symptoms and then the herbicides. So if you see plants that have these symptoms, send us some samples and we can, we can do some testing and see if we either find rhodococcus or if we find area food mites or phytoplasma. So here are some symptoms. You get these shoot proliferations that are coming out of every little bud, every opening. Here you see the same at the base of a plant. You get these dense clusters of shoots that are growing. Now, oftentimes leafy gall is also called crown gall, but they're actually two different diseases. So leafy gall is caused by Rhodococcus faciens and crown gall is caused by Acrobacterium tumefaciens. With leafy galls, you have shoots sprouting from those tumors, but there's no shoots that are produced if you have crown gall. You just get these big tumors, but there's no shoots. Both of them can infect through wounds. Leafy gall also through natural openings. Both of them are soil borne. And crown gall can infect many woody plants, but they can also be found sometimes on perennial cut flowers. Versus leafy gall infects mostly herbaceous plants. So here you can see the the difference. This is a dahlia tuber that has leafy gall. You see all these shoots that are starting to develop. And then this is crown gall. And there's no shoots developing. It will look like this the, its entire time. It can sit there for years. This is on a rose, but this is quite common. Management of leafy gall, remove infected plants. If neighboring plants are very close, so they could potentially get infected, you might want to remove those as well. Get symptomatic plants tested to determine what the actual cause was. Do not take cuttings from infected plants and sterilize pruning tools between plants. So use either a 70% alcohol solution or some disinfecting wipes to clean the plates when you cut between the different plants so you're not spreading the pathogens. This does not only apply to rhodococcus, this applies to a lot of different bacteria and some viruses. And then use new or sterilized pots and trays to plant new planting material. If you sterilize your pots and trays yourself, use a 10 to 15% household bleach solution Emerge, immerse them for about 30 minutes to an hour, and then rinse them really well with water afterwards. 
do you don't have any residual chlorine left that could cause phytotoxicity. Now we'll move from the diseases to the insects and the scourge of my last year's trials, the grasshoppers. So they lay eggs in the fall in pastures and fence rows and ditches. Eggs hatch in April to June. The nymphs go through five instars before they turn into adults. And they usually produce one generation a year. So here are some pictures from my Dahlia trials. You can see the damage they, they caused. There was actually not much left of any of these Dahlia plants that we had planted. They also went to sunflowers that were next door to the dahlias and caused a lot of the damage on those flowers as well. To manage grasshoppers, bait is really good. So nolo bait was a fungal pathogen of grasshoppers that was commercially produced, but unfortunately it's currently not available. The factory burned down two years ago and they have not reopened. Sema spore is the same fungal pathogen. It's also not available. You can use some bait that contains carbaryl that will also kill the grasshoppers. Insecticides, most insecticides registered for grasshoppers are affected against the nymphs, but not against the adults. You can use floating row covers on young plants that will deter them, but eventually you probably have to take them off for once the plants get really big and then the grasshoppers will still come in and decimate your flowers. And there's leaf hoppers. As I mentioned before, some of them can transmit phytoplasma and they can also transmit viruses like beet curly top virus. And sometimes those beet leaf hoppers will come into your yard or on your farm and they will probe and feed on some plants and then they realize they don't like the taste, so they move on. You will not know that these plants have been visited by beet leaf hoppers until a few weeks later, you see the symptoms of either curly top or phytoplasma. A bumble flower beetle, it lays eggs in compost and soil with high organic matter. You can see them on the flowers oftentimes. They're not supposed to cause much damage, but occasionally they might feed on, on flowers. They usually feed on plant sap and overripe fruit and vegetables. And the adults emerge in mid-August to September, so we see them later in the season. And there's one generation per year. So here you can see the, the grubs. And then here are some of the adults that we see. And these are, are feeding on some sap, and there's wasps and some flies coming in that also want to feed on that sap. And then we have earwigs. There's a bunch of earwigs here. There's some eggs and some of the nymphs. They cause a lot of damage just by feeding. Oh, Claudia, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut you off. We're nope. at the